Next up, we're going to have Helen Little. Um, Helen Little is going to talk to us about another big problem of plastic waste and printing with recycled plastics. Great to have you, Helen, um, and uh, take it away. Hello, thank you for that introduction. Um, let me share my screen. Do, 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 do. Uh, let's see, I'll just do that entire screen. All right. All right, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Helen Little and I'm from a company called Re3D and I'm here to talk about a 3D printing material testing procedure. So looking at an overview of what I'm gonna talk about today, um, I'm gonna go through the background motivation behind creating this material testing procedure. And then I will go into depth about what the procedure entails. So um, how to test extrusion, how to test um, optimizing for different print geometries, how to test for material properties, and then finally, all the documentation resources about this whole procedure that exists. So first, background motivation. What's the point of having a 3D printing uh, material testing procedure? So I work at Re3D and it's a full service 3D printer startup. We manufacture large format industrial 3D printers um, at an accessible cost. So you can see this person on the right side here is to scale to our 3D printers. So when I mean big, I mean big. And really our ethos is to um, enable people to have um, access to manufacturing at scale using additive manufacturing. Um, so we have a ton of different 3D printers that do that. But another part of uh, our company that's really important to us is the sustainability aspect of additive manufacturing. So we asked ourselves, what does it look like if you took plastic trash and put it into a granulator or a shredder to chop it up into little pieces and then take those pieces and feed them directly into a 3D printer without having to transform it into filament or anything like that. And then you can 3D print a product out of um, those granules and then um, a customer can use that product. And once the product reaches the end of its life cycle, then it goes back into the trash and re-enters this um, infinite loop to create this circular economy. And so that is what brought us to pellet 3D printing. Um, so on the left here, I have a picture of some 3D printer filament. And typically, filament is about 10 times more expensive than plastic pellets. Um, that's because of the added costs of manufacturing the plastic into that filament. Um, so it's a lot cheaper to use pellets instead. But uh, if you go even further, what if you can print directly from trash, which is potentially free or even has a negative cost associated with it, depending on maybe there's costs uh, associated with storing that plastic. And this is really important, um, especially as you increase the size of whatever you're 3D printing, because the larger the object is, the more the material costs matter. So this is also like an economic scalability issue um, and not just a sustainability one. And that led us to make our 3D printer, which is a pellet 3D printer. Um, the framework is very similar to the filament 3D printers we make, but the really key part here is that the extruder is different. It can accept um, pellets and flakes and regrind and different little particles and then extrude out. And then beyond the extruder, it acts a lot more like your typical Cartesian 3D printer. However, there are challenges when it comes to material testing. Um, some of y'all may have tested filament in the past, um, and usually filament is it's designed for 3D printing. Usually the manufacturer has tested it, they put additives in it to make it uh, work well for 3D printing. So it sometimes there's some testing involved, but it's usually not as much um, as pellets. Uh, so pellets are often designed for other manufacturing methods such as injection molding, and they're not tested in a 3D printing system. Um, so, you know, it's it's a little bit, um, there's a lot of things that need to be optimized if you try to print with a new material. And then when it comes to trying to print with plastic regrind waste, it's the Wild West, right? Right, Like that plastic can have all sorts of different types of plastics in it. It might have contaminants. Um, it might have um, all sorts of different prop unknown properties that need to be figured out in order to actually 3D print with it. 
But, you know, if we can't figure this out, it would be really amazing because there are a ton of cool applications that um, we could use this 3D printing for. So I have some, just a few here. This is definitely not an exclusive list. Um, so things like utility solutions, fixtures and jigs, architecture and furniture, um, education, and then um, prototyping for product launches. So there's a whole host of industries and applications that we can apply this to, and they all have different needs, which means that conceivably there are countless materials that um, it would be really useful if we could figure out how to 3D print with them at scale. And this is real. At Re3D, we've been um, testing dozens of materials and through that testing have been able to establish um, print settings and improve our hardware in order to actually 3D print with these materials and make these really cool objects. So when you try to 3D print something, there are a lot of things that are happening simultaneously that can affect the uh, success of the print. So the first thing is your material properties. So what material are you printing with? What are its uh, melting temperatures, viscosities? What is the uh, physical form of it? Is it like a cylindrical pellet? Is it spherical? Is it an irregularly shaped flake? That can all have an impact on printing. And then we have the hardware. So what are the specifications for the extruder? What are the dimensions for the extruder? Um, what are the sort of ancillary features such as like, do you have a heated bed? Do you have part cooling? All these things on the hardware side can affect the success of your final print. And then there's also the slicer settings. So these are um, settings such as the temperatures that you set, print speed, um, print resolution. There are a whole host of different settings that can be optimized in this realm to uh, ensure a successful print. And then finally, you have part geometry. So that can have a huge effect on uh, how successful your print is. Um, the geometry can be designed for specific types of 3D printing or for use with specific materials, depending on the needs. So all of these are happening at the same time when you try to 3D print something. So if something goes wrong in the testing, it is oftentimes difficult to pinpoint what aspect uh, among these host of factors is actually causing that. And odds are it's probably a combination of multiple factors, which brings us to the challenge. Um, how do you solve a complex multivariable problem such as material testing and new material for 3D printing? And uh, the solution that we've come up with after, I don't even know how many hours of material testing, dozens of materials, is uh, we've created a procedure that isolates the variables in a systematic order to optimize all the factors at play. Which brings us to our material testing procedure. Um, so this is really high level, breaking it down into the different sections. And the idea here is First, subjecting the material to the most basic of tests and making sure that the most basic needs are optimized and confirmed before gradually subjecting it to more complicated and demanding um, demands for the, from the material. So first, we start with extrusion. Can the material even extrude out of the extruder? Um, then once we've established we have good extrusion, we move on to print optimization. So what kind of... Uh, print geometries can we actually achieve with this material? And then once that is optimized, we can move on to material properties. So this is more for industrial applications of getting information on tensile strength and those kind of things um, to determine and quantify uh, exactly like what the properties of your final print are. So Launching into the actual procedure, we start with extrusion testing. So how do we test if a material can actually extrude? The very first thing we do is we dehydrate the material. Um, most polymers are, or many polymers are hygroscopic, so they absorb water from the air. And if you try to print with wet plastic, it causes all of these print quality issues um, and that's really difficult to try to troubleshoot other issues with the print if you're having to contend with um, issues because the material wasn't dehydrated properly. So um, I have some examples here of uh, for a low fidelity drying solution, you can use a hot air food dehydrator from Walmart or something, um, or you can go the more industrial route with a desiccant dehydrator. 
And then if you want to be really rigorous, you can have a moisture analyzer that can analyze exact moisture content of your sample. So this is the very first thing you do. It helps make sure that you're starting like at a good place with your uh, dried material. The next test we do is we conduct particle analysis. Um, we use an open source software called ImageJ that is free to download. And what the software enables you to do is to take a picture of your particle sample and the software will count the area of your particles and give you um, particle size and shape data. So this is super useful to really quantify that your particle sample. Um, and this graph here shows um, how we used ImageJ to compare different processing methods on RPET flake and how that affected the size of the particles. Um, it also serves as a great way to identify, oh, maybe these particle sizes are way too large to print with, or there's too many large particles, or there are too many small ones. So once we've established that, we can actually put the material in the extruder and try to extrude. So this is when we um, establish the initial temperatures um, for the material to extrude. So if it's too cold, the material is not going to extrude out. If it's too hot, um, the material will have too low of a viscosity and it will um, ooze out of the extruder. So this is just establish initial temperatures so that we can actually have some material extruding. The next test we do is testing for extrusion consistency. So um, that is referring to if you keep all the variables constant, can you um, ensure that you have a consistent amount of material that comes out of the extruder? Because if it's not consistent, that means that you will have, uh, it won't be reliable for your printing. You may have holes in your print or it may be over extruded in some areas. And if you have inconsistent extrusion, that can indicate a whole host of issues, such as maybe it has issues with feeding, or your nozzle is clogged, or there are contaminants in the sample, um, or maybe your, your temperatures need a little bit more optimization, like they're too low or you're, they're too high and you're having material bridging. And the way that we uh, check extrusion consistency is like really quick and dirty. We basically um, extrude um, a certain amount of material for five trials, and then we mass the extrudate and then from that, calculate the standard deviation of that mass. And so this will really identify like huge uh, changes in extrusion consistency, because ideally, if you extrude five times, each time you should extrude the same amount, right? <laughs> so um, this is a really helpful thing to check. Another thing that we test for is the maximum extrusion rate. So this is how uh, much material an extruder can push out uh, within a given amount of time. And this is a super helpful metric to um, talk to customers and end users about because usually people ask, um, how long does it take to print um, this object? Well, if we have a maximum extrusion rate, then they can say, oh, since this object is five kilograms, then uh, if the extruder runs at one kilogram per hour, then at the minimum, it'll take five hours to print our part. So it gives you like a nice rough estimate. And the way that we calculate the maximum extrusion rate is we first determine the maximum extrusion speed by basically increasing the speed until it, it can't extrude that fast anymore. And then we do the same thing with extruding a certain amount of uh, material and then taking the mass. And then once you have the mass, you can just divide it by the amount of time it took to extrude. And that will tell you the extrusion rate. And uh, we have like a spreadsheet calculator where all these uh, formulas are already input. And it's just a matter of putting in the data and it automatically calculates for you. So if a material succeeds in extrusion testing, then we can move on to actually trying to print some geometries with it. And the idea here is to start with the simplest geometries first and then slowly work up to more and more complicated geometries. Um, so the first geometry we start with is a calibration cylinder. So it's a cylinder with two bottom layers and then a single perimeter um, outline, so it's hollow, and then the, there's no top layers. And what this tests is bed adhesion because you have some bottom layers. Um, and it's also really good for testing extrusion rate and calibrating that because you can take a pair of calipers and measure the layer width of that wall. And if it's 
lower than expected, that means you're under extruding. If it's higher than expected, then it's over extruding. And you can um, account for that in the slicer settings to really uh, dial in that number. And it's also helpful for further optimizing the extruder temperatures because the temperature range at which you can extrude is usually larger than the temperature at range that's ideal for printing. So maybe it extrudes fine at a certain temperature, but when you actually try to print something, it's a little bit too hot or too cold and it causes issues with the print. So once the calibration cylinder is, uh, is established, we move on to uh, our next test print, which is our MOI. Um, and this is basically like our standard print that we use across different materials so that we can compare the behavior of different materials against each other. Um, this is just what Re3D uses. Um, I know a lot of people tend to like to use the Benchy, so that's another good um, option. But basically like having a standard thing that you can use across multiple materials so that you can actually compare them is really helpful. And then the other option I want to uh, share about is the NIST test artifact. This is an open source geometry that is available for free download on the NIST website. And it essentially has a ton of features on it that will test certain things about your printer. Um, so it has small features. It can test bridging, stair stepping, stringing, and hole geometry. And this is really useful if you're trying to do an application with um, high resolution and um, more complex geometries. So once you actually have some uh, print settings and geometries tested, then we move on to material properties. So we have an AdMet universal testing machine. And what we'll do is we will um, 3D print these tensile bars according to the ASTM D638 standard. And then we can load those test uh, tensile bars into the machine and the machine will pull them apart and get um, data on the elongation and the tensile strength um, and so this is really helpful to get quantitative data on how strong your prints are and, or maybe how flexible your prints are. Um, and this is really useful for a uh, like more industrial, more rigorous um, applications. And finally, documentation. So this is not going to be this won't be open source unless there is documentation on it that is open source and available to refer to. So. Um, Re3D, we have a knowledge base um, that is essentially like our wiki. And on there, you will find a material testing procedure all written out, um, basically outlining what I talked about. And uh, we also have a ton of supporting documentation in the form of knowledge base articles that will help with troubleshooting any part of the material testing procedure. So let's say you're going through the material testing procedure and your material is not adhering to the bed. Well, we have an article on that that will basically tell you these are all the things that can cause poor bed adhesion and these are the things that you can do to try to address that. And the link is at the bottom there if anyone's interested. I also, um, every single month, will write up my R&D updates from the month and post them on our forum on our website. And that includes if I ever do any kind of material testing in-house. So I'll write up all the results of that, um, all the settings I did, all the different tests that I had to do, and put them on the knowledge base So um, on, or in the forum, sorry. And uh, so if you really want to deep dive into that, um, that is also another really great resource to refer to. Awesome. Great.